Hey, I'm Bridget Rigby, uh, Director of Maker Camp, and I'm very excited to welcome you to our Maker Campfire number five. We are um, just lighting up the fire, our digital fire, and we um, have some wonderful makers and camp leaders as guests today here with us around the fire, so I'll introduce them in, the, in a moment. And this week's campfire is all on our Give It Form project path. So this is the path that works with um, making everything from you know, 2D materials. Um, sometimes you'll see even today, sometimes it's 1D materials, but turning these materials into 3D shapes and forms. And that's um, lots of different materials from paper and cardboard prototyping, all the way up on to digital sculpting and 3D printing. So you'll see a lot of different uh, materials used and a lot of making in many dimensions. So um, first of all, I'd like to share um, and our guests here and have everybody have a chance to pop up and say hello. Um, so we have, um, we have Angela, one of our, our leaders from a camp. She's at a library camp out in New York. Would you like to say, pop up and say hi? Hi, everybody. So I'm Angela Horseman from Mastic Shirley and Merch's Community Library. And we're having a lot of fun in our maker camp. Wonderful. Okay, and then um, going, let's, let's um, then we'll go Danny, just kind of left to right. Hi everyone, my name's Danny. I made up an art film called Tetagami and I'm hanging out in my studio in Sacramento, California. Cool, with some amazing tape creations in the background, I see. Okay, Evan? Yes, hi, I'm Evan from UNC Greensboro in Greensboro, North Carolina. And one of our projects is the Learning Factory Maker Camp, which runs two weeks every summer. Wonderful. So cool to have a camp represented at a university. So very neat. OK, Kathy. Hi, I'm Kathy Ciceri. I'm an author for Make. Um, my book, Paper Invention, some of the projects were on Maker Camp recently. So that was really exciting. Definitely. You'll see Kathy's projects from, um, from that book. She has many other books as well, but you'll see them throughout many of our different paths. And she even has a new make book coming out that fits very nicely with one of our project paths this summer. So she'll have yeah. to tell us a little bit more about that later. All right, Jeff. And hi, my name is Jeff Stratter. Uh, I work at Salmon Public Library. And this summer, we're doing two different types of make camps. One is with in partnership with our summer reading program called Build a Better World. And the other is kind of a design thinking challenge. Wonderful. Well, great. And we will have Carolyn joining us um, mid fire as well. She's working with her campers right now, but she'll be popping on. So she'll get to say hello um, when she does. And um, first, I'd love to show you the projects along our path to get a sense for what our campers are doing along with some of the cool creations from the world. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, it's doing that strange thing again. Hmm. Let's see. Let's try this one more time. Presenting to everybody? Yes. Don't do that. Okay. Or at least don't do that until you have your screen share set up. Actually, I'm not. Um, okay. Try and try one more time here. Try the just the application window. Okay, you know, that is not working at the moment. I will work on that and we'll get it up there. So I think what we should do, we'll come back to the projects from around the world and the path. And if we could start with, uh, with the camp sharing, I think that would be great. And uh, Jeff, I know since you have to pop out, would you like to go first? Sure. Okay, okay so um again like i was saying in my intro we're doing two different type of make camps here this summer this is our first attempt at any of this um the one is with in partnership with the summer reading theme this year which is build a better world and one of the projects that we were working on there um, was with a sense of cardboard prototyping 
and we asked the kids, we just gave them a bunch of cardboard and said, um, create whatever. And one of the tools that we, we use to do that, and I don't know if anybody has used these before, but they're um, called uh, Make Do Toolkit. And within that toolkit, it's, um, it's quite, uh, you get a uh, mini saw and it has a hole punch in the back to punch a hole in your cardboard. And you also get a uh, nice plastic mini screwdriver, which probably if you don't have these, these could all be 3D printed as well. I'm sure there's models online for that. Um, then you also get a large number of um, plastic rivets. And from that, then you can create, um, let's see if I can show um, one of the images on the ground. Like we, somebody did a kind of paper doll house there out of cardboard and each one of those have rivets in them. And if I, if my screen share works, we'll see. Jeff, I recognize that house from the cute little girl that was holding it up. She's actually in my, in my pictures. <laughs> Oh, okay. Is, that, is the screen sharing? Let's see. Does that is that working there? Your, yours yeah. is working great. So here's some here's some photos of some kids that um, and what they made during that um, outdoor activity. So it was just a bunch of creativity going on. They designed whatever. Some of the kids uh, did wearable uh, wearable cardboard. Others made physical objects and things like that. So that's one of the kind of two D three D um, projects that we were working on. Another. Um, is this design thinking challenge I decided. So I decided to take more of a look at um, making in terms of how we make. So that was asking people to, let me screen share this, go through this process here, which is ask, imagine, plan, create, test and improve. And each week we were doing, we're tackling a different subject. Um, but for the 2D, 3D um, portion of this, um, what we did was we went out to the pool and uh, the kids decided they wanted to create a slide for the uh, community pool and we had them measure the pool and what they came up with was so this was the past week what we did was they came up with um, a sketch they measured the whole pool and we're gonna they, they took this abstract kind of um, planning and then they scaled it onto uh, this sheet which one block would equal two feet and then next week, we're going to take this image and we are going to uh, 3D print it. So we're going to take that scaled up model on 2D and we're going to 3D print out our pool. We're going to 3D print out the slide that they want. And then they're going to be able to physically move that slide around the scaled model on the pool and they can see where it fits. We're going to do a test phase, how it would work. And then we'll eventually take that to probably City Hall and a bunch of places and see if we can actually get this um, slide for them. And these are 11-year-olds, um, 10-year-olds. Uh, so these aren't even the older kids and they're working through this, this whole process. And part of that, um, the last thing I'll share here, part of that design process um, before that phase came was, if I'm sharing correctly, uh, over here, so what we have is um, part of the planning process was we had a long, uh, um, a closed line of all the different parts of the plan that would take them to get there. So we worked our way up. We also did um, how to make a good plan. And I had them build an object with seven Legos. Then I had uh, um, them pass that object to the right. And I had the next student try to write up plans and instructions for that object. And then I had that person take that Lego apart pass that and the instructions to another person and see if they could follow those instructions and create that um, that object from it. So some people got close to what the original object was, some people did not um, based off of, but we learned a lot about planning and how a plan goes from maybe 2D to 3D um, portion of it. So it was a good learning lesson Very for everybody. Cool. But that's Very kind of what we're working on here at Salmon. And as part of the design thinking process, did the they have to go you know, to the pool and slide down the slide to kind of get into the user experience? <laughs> yes, I wish I had those photos. I haven't put them up online yet, but um, we actually, fortunately, there was a slide in the park that they actually got to go slide down and take measurements of that slide. And that's how we kind of model, that's what our model slide is, is used from. But yes, we definitely went out to the pool. We rented a bus and took them out there and they got really hands on. Very cool. Very cool. I love it. Does love anybody it. have any anybody? questions in the group? I don't have a question, but I just want to say it's a really cool like whole process that you have there. 
And I loved that Lego activity because it's so simple, but it's like they have to think and they have to work as a team because it's not just one person now, it's multiple people kind of rebuilding the same thing and kind of watching person one and then the last person probably gives them a nice eye opener to see how well they work. I love that whole project you just did and I might have to borrow that. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think we'll break out that project again here coming up. I don't know if you can see me. I don't know why I see myself anymore, but um, hopefully you can still hear me. Yes? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. For the, for the improved portion of that uh, design process, we will be breaking out the Legos again. And one I learned on a TED Talk was, again, take seven Legos, have somebody build something very personal to them, and then have a person across from them take that part right in front of them and build something else with it. And it's kind of showcasing to these um, students that if we want to improve upon our design, we have to be able to let it go out into the world and have people be able to um, take it apart and put things back together and it might actually further improve their design. Very cool. I have a question from the audience. Um, so Jeff, did you see my student's dinosaur? No, I did not see your student's <laughs> dinosaur. I don't have any more context on that at the moment, but we'll, we'll come back to that. I know your students have an awesome, like maybe it's a dinosaur head or a dragon head. I wonder if that's what they're referring to. Maybe that's what they're referring <laughs> to. Wonderful. Well, great. That was an amazing, um, amazing example, as Angela said, of, of really merging design thinking with making, with the physical prototyping making and learning the physical making techniques along with the whole process. So thank you for sharing. And I hope that a lot of other camps are inspired to try that if they're not already doing something along those lines. Wonderful. Well, any others before we jump to Angela? All right, Angela, let's hear about what you're making at the Library of New York. All right. So we are actually starting our second session. So our, our camp was broken into two sessions this summer, one in July, one in August. And we actually just finished today with our last day of our 3D printing themed week. And we started off the week by actually using Tinkercad since it's a free software and we use it a lot in the library. The kids love it. We could have spent all week of them just building different things on the site. And that's something I wanna say for anyone out there, if you don't have access to a 3D printer, it's still awesome to show the kids the software because they love just using it. <laughs> Even if they don't actually get something out of it, like physical, they like that whole design aspect. And I, like I said, I have kids who could have did that like this whole summer long and they would have been fine with that. Um, so we did that, but we've also done a lot of other like 3D, uh, 3D kind of themed projects, even in some of our other weeks. So like our art week, we built cardboard letters. So we had everyone kind of figure out what letter they wanted. Most of them picked their initial and we used recycled book paper. So books we would normally have kind of thrown away and they built their kind of a prototype you can see out of cardboard, more recycled materials, and then covered it with books you would have normally thrown away. So if you're in a library, you might have all of these materials readily available, which is amazing because now we're giving new life to the books and it looks really cool. Even this one that's not finished looks awesome kind of there. Um, I love it. I know, it's, I, I think it's great. It's like a for <laughs> but we have also, yes, thank you. Um, but we actually have a lot of really cool technology at our library and we, I wanted to make it available to our community and as well as our camp members. So we have um, an HTC Vi, which is a um, virtual reality system. So for Maker Camp, to keep it in a Maker theme, I had all the kids try it out and we did um, Tilt Brush, which was painting in virtual reality. So they, we put the music on, the headsets on, and they were just in that painting world. And we could have uh, 3D printed what they made, but it got a little crazy after not saving between one giant painting. <laughs> mess but i actually have some pictures let me see if i can pull it up one of the kids wrote his name in the virtual reality painting let me see if i can get that showing lots of we have lots of pictures in uh from here <laughs> we've been doing so many different things um let's see if i can find the virtual reality one there we go so this is kind of the kids using the virtual reality. And if you look at the bottom one, I hope you guys can see it. 
it shows um, the kid wrote his name and he was like so excited to be able to like get it perfect. He refreshed it a million times until he got it really looking the way he wanted. And even though we couldn't print them out for them, they just had a ball using it because this is the technology that they may not get to use otherwise. So it's nice to be able to bring what we have, our resources and technology to our community. Same thing with our printers. We are going to be 3D printing all the stuff they made on Tinkercad this week. It'll just take a, a week or so to get to them. And they're so excited to get to get the physical item that they created. And so I'm going to just kind of briefly go through some of our other pictures. We did some projects with PVC and we took all the leftover PVC and just made it like a creative challenge. So we had kids making everything from little robots to cubes. We made houses. We just kind of had a ball building with PVC. It's a very inexpensive material and readily available at Home Depot. So if you have like a kind of store like that, it's something you can get for fairly inexpensive for a couple pipes. We've done um, all different types. We use some of the stuff, some of the sponsors sent. We've had mag formers. We've did the squigs, all different types of building because why not? It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, uh, three doodlers, the kids actually they had a trouble with the three doodles. I don't know if anyone else has seen that issue where it's kind of a challenging tool to work with. Um, the kids all like trying it, but they just seem to kind of struggle with actually making something that looked, you know, like they wanted. Most of them didn't take anything home with them, but they just had fun kind of that whole building in 3D space. So we've been doing a whole bunch of stuff in all different realms of 2D to 3D type of, and even to 4D type of projects. Very cool. Very cool. And, oh, I'm echoing again. Oh, I'm echoing again. Oh, let me. How's it now? Okay, is that better? Um, well, very great. I was just going to share that at the tech um, camps at our 3D printing class, we used the doodler leading up to it, and um, it was very challenging to work with. So um, I think that that's kind of the nature, the nature of the tool, but boy, is it cool when you can get it working, right? It definitely requires that maker mindset in the process of iteration because there's a lot of failure and, you know, plastic kind of thrown about, but um, wonderful. Definitely. Well, I love that whole progression that you have. There's so many different ways to make in 3D. So thank you for sharing all of those dimensions of, of learning and making with us. Um, do you all, oh, do you have one more there? Yeah, I just forgot it was back there. For anyone who is looking for a cool way to do 3D building, really, really cheap. This is actually just straws and pipe cleaners. So oh, the cool. pipe cleaners you feed into the straw and they kind of act as your joint. You can twist them together and the straws give it stability enough to kind of freestand, free form. So it's a really cool way, really inexpensive option for camps out there who are kind of looking for something else to add, but don't want to spend a lot of lot more money than they may have already done or just working on certain budgets. It's fun too. I had kids build so many cool things that like one kid built something that he had hanging and he was excited to put in his room. So just something to kind of throw out there for anyone who's looking for an option or an idea. Very cool. Yeah, I love those structures where they're kind of like the wire frame and then you get to build up to the, the solid surfaces. Uh, wonderful. Anybody else have any questions here for Angela? I think we have one from the audience that could be for um, really for Angela or Jeff. It's, I think, connected to the library making. So are there any books that you specifically tie into your summer reading programs that go along with your Maker Camp program? Do you make that connection for the, for the campers? or for the, the kids at your library? I have some books that I've used, but it, I have so many that I don't know which one to pinpoint. Usually anything that's kind of related to building, we've had, I put a lot of make books out just so they can look through them and find projects. Um, I've had story books. I work in like the children department. So I've had a couple children's like story books just kind of to go with that maker feeling but I can't really pick one particular book because it's kind of related to every project. Cool, do you have any, um, Jeff? Uh, well, I would chime in and say, I always find that's the one of the challenges for libraries is how do you connect making and literacy and not with just specifically the make books, which are designed to make, but actual real 
um, literacy in the sense that they're storybook of some sort. And uh, I saw a cool project. Um, I don't know if she's developed it yet. I'm sure other libraries have done it themselves, but she's going to market it this way. Is um, uh, a librarian out of Pittsburgh is making these stickers that she puts on the front cover uh, or the inside cover of a children's book that has all materials and supplies and a project to make from just reading a normal storybook, which is a really cool idea. So you read the book and like whether it's a hungry, hungry caterpillar or something like that, but it's a project very specific for that book. Um, if I ever have that information, I'm sure I could share it with people because I thought it was a really, really neat idea. And not, not that stopping a library could do it themselves too, a person could do it themselves. Great connection. I love that. All right. Well, Evan, can we hear a little bit more what's going on at your university camp? Sure. So our Learning Factory camp is actually split up into eight different courses or classes that the campers can take. And this year we had two sessions that were related to 3D design and 3D modeling. So similar to Jeff's, we had one session that was related to cardboard and it was just called Build It With Boxes. And then similar to Angela, we did have a build or make it in 3D where the campers use the 3D printers as well as the three doodlers. So with the, with the build it with boxes for the middle grades camp, and I don't have any pictures, but I know Bridget that you saw several of those on Twitter with the yes. masks that were made. Oh my gosh, the sugar skulls. <laughs> so so the, the director of our, of our camp program, he was able to download some of the different templates that you could get. And then using really thin cardboard, you um, used adhesive to put the template onto the cardboard and then through using tape and folds and cuts, you create these masks. And then the, what the campers did, some of the campers would paint them and decorate them, you know, with with things like that. Others, one of the students created kind of a collage that represented her. So all of the things that she liked, she was cutting and pasting, and that's how she decorated it. The teachers for that camp, which was the middle grades, they were thinking about how they could use it in the classroom. So with both of them being science teachers thinking about the skeletal system and how they could bring the skulls back to their classroom and have the have the kids using those. And instead of painting them or using the collage, they could uh, put things that were related to their curriculum. Uh, for the cardboard with the elementary grades, uh, similar that Jeff mentioned, using the make-do pieces to hold the cardboard together. And the teachers for that, or for that group actually read a they read a curious george book that it was about curious george going golfing and if they they <laughs> tied that into the discussion and then the campers split up into small groups and their desire they had to use the cardboard in the room and their project was to out of cardboard to create miniature golf holes so by by the end of the camp week they had three or four holes that the group had created so when we had our maker fair at the end of the week the parents were able to come in and see their miniature golf course that they had. So, did the so parents, kind of time. Do the so, parents get to play? Yeah, we had some of the clubs because the teachers were able to order some clubs because they found that when they tried to build them themselves, they were they were falling apart. So they got some plastic foam type clubs and used those. So, cool. Then with the with the 3D printing, we saw a lot, like Angela mentioned, with the students really liking Tinkercad and able to bring the design process and using the, the software on the computers. And they were able to, both the middle grades and the elementary grades, were able to design and print one object during the week. And with the elementary grades, the big hit was was the three doodler. And for, for the younger campers, we used the three doodler start. So it, it takes away any hot surfaces. So with the with some of the other three doodlers, the extruder gets really hot. So we didn't want the campers to have the risk of burning themselves. So with the with the start, they had uh, I have a few projects. So one was an Eiffel Tower that was created. So using the template that they have inside the three doodler book, uh, creating something like that, and then one theme that the teacher carried through the week is they read a story at the beginning of the week of, I forget the title of the book, but the two kids were becoming detectives. So she themed her week in camp with these um, younger elementary students all designed around 
creating things for their spy kit because the characters in the story were building spy kits. So each day they would you know, have a discussion and talk about the planning process and you know, how do you how do you identify what's going to be best for you? And so some things were like they had their their spy glasses that they created. Oh wow! So they for left <laughs> with their set of spy glasses using the three doodler. You and might then, have to wear those during this whole hangout. Those are awesome. <laughs> yeah, those those are a pair that I put together. So they're not as not as good as the campers were. Theirs were a little more sturdy. Um, then they had time to uh, kind of freelance at the end of the week and make something that they would put into their spy kit that was unique to what they'd created. So, you know, something could follow a template in the in the start book and create a helicopter. Uh, other students were creating things that looked like miniature walkie talkies. And then with those, instead of being, uh, there was one, this wasn't from the camp, but similar to using the template, but a guitar. So some would create fairly flat objects, but still bringing the pen to life and making it three dimensional. Others would would take on similar to the Eiffel Tower where you had to piece things together so they could make their walkie talkies or their cameras and actually make them have them thicker and have more depth. So teaching, you know, bringing in the literacy, bringing in the collaboration skills, but then also the design process of creating a template so what you're going to, you're going to draw it out and this is what you're going to use the pen to trace over and then having to identify the spatial representation to know which pieces are going to fit where when you glue everything together with the plastics. Cool. So some of, some of the things that they were doing. I love seeing those of examples of what they doodled in 3D. It's so cool to see on the community, um, right? But it's really cool to see it like that in 3D and your, your 3D Eiffel Tower. Ooh la la, I love that one. <laughs> um, and after seeing those examples, I want to test one more si time to see if my screen share is working because um, I have a picture of your sugar skulls that I would love to show. So let's see if we have any better luck. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yay, oh, I'm so happy. OK. Let's start near the beginning here. I get to show all of all these fun examples. OK, so we actually have your sugar skulls right um, to start. And I know people made one was a sugar skull. There were lots of different you know, superhero kind of masks. I love this one, too, where they um, decided to paste on all these awesome words. And it's also sweet. I see a little Skittles. So it's kind of a sugar skull in its own right. Um, and then you see some examples of the great kind of wireframe, the, you know, the pieces connected to make these great, beautiful geometric shapes out of so many different materials. Paper, gumdrops, straws. And then, Jeff, we have some of the great pictures from your camp of your amazing making. I think this might be the, the, uh, the dragon head, the dinosaur head that they were talking about here. And, and I believe that's the house that is in your space at the moment. And you can see people making out of cardboard, paper, origami shapes. Um, we get to the, the paper makey, which is along the path. Um, and then I love these, these um, kind of cardboard squares that people created where you're almost building with pixels, but in, in real life in 3D. And I believe that um, the one to the right here even has copper tape on it. So that might be a conductive castle, which is cool. Um, then on the bottom, we have some great cardboard animals being invented, unicorns and elephant-like creatures. And then, of course, it jumps to a lot of the 3D doodler, like you all have shared. Um, so I think these are from some of your camps as well. And I was very excited to see some sculpting in clay that led to a um, scene of a digital s'more, the digital campfire. So I had challenged um, our big creative challenge last week was to um, help us figure out what a digital s'more is. And I believe that is an amazing example. Um, so then we see a lot of the, um, the designing the digital sculpting and and really printing as well um, and here's a here's a camper that has some glasses like yours evan um, so and i love this last one where they they 3d printed a brain so we all have 3d printing on the brain and now we have a 3d printed brain it's very cool uh, all right so i'm going to take that off
All right. So I um, wanted to show that. And then um, I guess I didn't uh, get to share all of the projects along the path, but I'm going to ask. I want to leave um, enough time to hear from the rest of our camps and our awesome makers. So I think um, many of you have seen, seen the paths, but we can get to that at the end if we have time. Um, but for now, I believe that Carolyn has just joined us from, Southern, from a school in Southern California. So if you want to say hi and share a little bit about the cool uh, projects that you all are working on in 3D. Sure, uh, 3D. Yeah, um, so for us, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay. Um, we've been using Lulzbot Taz for our 3D printer and uh, we use Tinkercad for the design part. Sometimes we'll go to Thingiverse just to get an idea on one. So like our balloon car, we took straight from Thingiverse. That was a four hour print. So we pretty much made one balloon car and then made uh, paper towel tube balloon racers to kind of race against the 3D printed car. And then in Tinkercad, um, they made name tags or keychains cool. that they can um, use. And then of course, fidget spinners. Oh, that yes. was another huge project. <laughs> so we've got those going. We're finding and those then, appearing all over and out of so yeah. many different materials this summer. <laughs> and then uh, bookmarks were a big hit because we were, that part of the camp was a four week camp and it had about 80 students. So I had to limit their projects to a 30 minute print. And so those were the, pretty much, they could design their keychain, the fidget spinner or the bookmark um, for this camp this year. Because it was also part of just a digital and physical making class. So 3D was just one component. It wasn't just the whole class. Wonderful. And you all started with the, um, like leading up to the 3D printing, you all do a lot of the low tech 3D, 2D to 3D kind of building and prototyping first. Can you share a little bit yeah. about that? Um, yeah, uh, through the Exploratorium up in San Francisco, one of their tweets was their cardboard attachments, which was this one that was online. I don't know. And so I went ahead and, and retyped it. And so every student receives one of these blank and then all the cardboard to be able to recreate all the different attachments. And so now I took a picture of one of the students one. And so these are just cards that stay at the tables. So that way, if they're trying to make something, they can refer back to it. And then they get to learn to use the tools. I usually do that on the first or second day of class so that they, one, get to use our tools, our, our supplies efficiently. I tell them that, you know, we don't want to cut cardboard straight from the middle, just like if you're sewing, you wouldn't just cut right out of the middle of a piece of fabric, use your cardboard wisely. Um, and then the attachment help us save tape and glue. And then they also get to learn to use my favorite tool, with, which is our crocodile. And so that'll hole punch. I don't know if you can see it's a 1 eighth or a 3 sixteenths hole right down in there. And it'll punch through thick cardboard, uh, tin, and a lot of paper and wood. So like through our tongue depressors and our craft sticks, they can punch through. And then they, that's how they learn to do the brass fasteners. Um, which go right down there. So within the first day or two, I get to see who's going to use our tools appropriately. And then they also know what tools we have. So they, they see if it's scotch tape or duct tape or packing tape, that that's the right um, tape for the job. And then what scissors. I have a box cutter and an X-Acto, but they come to me for that. It's more of a station. Like if they know their scissors won't work, um, then they come to me for the other cutting. The other tools we have for them with that cardboard is um, make do. We saw those up at Maker Fair this year um, and one of our Q conferences that we go to for teachers. And so it's got this tool, which is a cardboard saw. And then at the end, it's got a little punch. And then they can attach these little screws through their screwdriver. And so what they do is they prototype with these things and then if they make something that they like, they have to take these out and replace them with brats and then they can take those projects home with them. Okay. And then for the ones that are just kind of getting started but don't really know what they want to do, we got them a few of the make do starter kits, like this is a T-Rex. And one of our students, um, there was a puppy kit and he really loved the puppy kit but couldn't take it home. So I had him take it apart, trace all the shapes out on cardboard recreate it and then made it with Brad so you could take it home. That way that kind of, it gave them enough of structure to help them get started um, and not just uh, create from scratch on that one. 
Wonderful. And yeah, make dos are wonderful cardboard building sets. Um, Jeff had shared that his love for those as well before you came on. Um, oh, good. And I like what you yeah, said ab fun. about the attachments allow you to save tape. And I just wonder what we could possibly do with all that tape that you save. Oh, huh. <laughs> I don't know, Danny. Do you have any ideas about that? Uh, I've had a few. <laughs> I think we should jump into the world at world of tape. Um, does anybody before we do? Does anybody have any questions from what Carolyn just shared? All right. Well, thank you very much. All right, yeah. Danny. We'd love to hear and see what's happening over over with you. Over there. I'm just keeping myself busy. Um, okay. So I've been. I, my background is in fine art and i'm a installation artist and a performance artist and i studied art history and sort of the development of consciousness of western society and for me why people don't spend all their free time making art is beyond me but it's it's because it's not accessible and the way in which it's talked about and shared is really inappropriate to me um, that's one of the reasons I've gotten out of showing at art galleries and museums and started participating in maker fairs and going around and teaching at libraries and just really teaching the creative process, which is the language that you learn when you study art. Um, and, you know, I'm like, what's when I tell people that they're all makers, it's the same thing as telling them that they're an artist. And it's just that we used to have to use our hands and our imaginations to create the world around us, and we've kind of gotten away from that. So what I found is that tape for me is the best tool to combine all of that together and if you think about this like you're going to be turning your hands into a 3d printer or it's liquid legos or it's the best fidget spinner ever you can take the tape and you can roll it into a tube or a line and you can take this line let me find my camera I'm getting better at teaching and you can start folding it back on itself to make form now it's you don't need the thing I love the most about it is you don't need any other materials to work with, just the tape. And, you know, a lot of people won't pick up a paintbrush because they've been told when they're younger that they're no good at drawing, but no one's been, people have been told just not to play with tape when they're younger. Um, so it actually makes it like a forbidden fruit. So you can make all sorts of objects with it. If you spend a lot of time, you can make really crazy things. Wow. Um, so, and all the color comes from colored tape, and then this is sealed in an epoxy resin. Um, but it has, the tape has a lot of potential beyond just being um, static form. Oh, wow. So, you can interweave um, mathematics or biology into what you're working with. I focus mostly on getting people's mindset to that place of play. You know, the first rule of Tabagami is that you have to have fun while you do it. And then there's an infinite number of second rules and we get to make those all up together as we go along. And when I teach people how to do it, I'm teaching them a new way of drawing in 3D. So I'm more focused on this is how everything fits together. I roll the tape with the adhesive on the outside so it can stick to itself and then show them the basic processes of folding and creating form. Um, we're right now developing some handheld tools that'll make this a lot easier. But once you can do this, it's a really freeing, frictionless way to create art. Now, it is a linear additive process, so that's kind of where the 3D printing reference comes in. You have to put pieces together and then bind them with a longer tube to make bigger sculptures. Um, the tape's also very translucent, so you can make really awesome lights with it. Um, and then it's it's because the adhesives on the outside you need you don't need any other materials to work with it, but it's also pre primed if you want to attach anything else to it. And I you know always encourage people. This is just one way of working with the material, but it's a way in which you can turn the tape into a string or into a pretty sturdy rope. Materials to it, and you can bind together. Also, you can do it anywhere. So you can be doing it on the bus ride somewhere. You can be doing it. While you're on an airplane, you can be doing it um, in the classroom. You know, for me, I always drew to get through school, and now I play with tape to get through life. So <laughs> that's pretty much like the where I'm at. Um, I really enjoy teaching at this point. 
Um, but again, like my background came from visual, like making something beautiful and making it interesting and speak, speaking to that place that we all came from as people. And so I think that making and creating is our first language. And so it's just my way to further that and to give people the tools to bring form. And that's pretty much what I do. Um, there's nothing specific here. I'm going to make some more really quick. And we can have highlights like so I know what to talk about. So I'll sit here and make us some more. And then um, if anyone has any questions, otherwise I can monologue too. Well, I, I love it. I just want to throw in that you um, you make the rolling of the tape look so easy. And I know that you've really uh, mastered that that technique after a lot of work. And I'm not, I'm not sure if anybody else in the group here has gotten to try this with your campers. Um, or even yourself, have you all, has anybody tried this cool rolling te te tape technique? Okay, so uh, we were lucky enough to have Danny, and we first met when I was at the Tech, and we had a maker fair at the Tech Gallery, and um, he was one of our featured makers and just brought this beautiful, um, like, sphere, this world. It just had a whole world um, of tape built on it. It was gorgeous, and everybody in the gallery just loved it. And then underneath, we'd have the kids, you know, really tinkering with it and making. And it's a, it's a challenging technique to learn at first, and it's, it's kind of similar to the 3D doodler in that way. You have to tinker with it and get it down, but then once you do, it's like fluid, just the way you, um, I just watched the way you roll that. And um, gosh, I really want to be able to get my technique to that level. Do you yeah, well, uh, that, that was two 900,000. So. <laughs> and counting. <laughs> yeah, give me 15 minutes with you on a Skype and I'll have you rolling tubes, no problem. It's more understanding the mechanics of it. Like when you're not pulling it, at all you're simply just turning it. So let me see if I can. And you push this, I'll do it backwards. Uh, you push this along itself. And if you think about the tape ribbon, this part, as a carpet. And if you roll up a carpet, if it's flat on the ground and you just push it, it rolls itself up. Mm -hmm. So it's more about not having any tension beyond the tape and then rotating it. And so one of your hands is the driver, and it's here and it's twirling the tape. And the other hand is just more of a steering wheel, and it's stopping it from getting bigger and guiding it along. And then you're just turning and pushing. And you go slow at first. You don't go quickly. Um, you know, we had, this is an interesting thing I want to throw out. We're developing what we're calling the magic wand, which is just going to be a really simple stick with a groove in it that's going to make it easier to roll the tubes. But I feel like part of what I really like is teaching people the fine motor skills um, to use their hands to create things. And I don't feel like that has as much importance as it used to because a lot more people are designing what they want to on a computer and then having something manufactured, which is for me, like makes more sense if you're applying it to the world if you're trying to create a product. But if you're trying to learn about yourself, I feel like just spending the time of that confidence that you can use your hands to make anything you want is more important. So I, that's why it's taken so long to like make it easier to roll the tape into a tube. Interestingly enough, though, there's a college in Germany that developed a auto-fed gun to roll tape into tubes with a sticky on the outside to prototype furniture, and that came out about two years ago. Wow. <laughs> I bet you could keep up with that gun, though, <laughs> if they had, like, Danny versus yeah, you know, the gun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so, I don't I know, if it. you guys have any thoughts on that, like, the difference between forcing people to use their hands to make stuff versus teaching them. I mean, I think both are important, but I've always been more on the same side of people using hands. There's something to it. Something is happening in the brain, right, as we, as we tinker and try to make things fit and make, turn our ideas into right, physical reality. Huge. Um, do you have any, from working with kids, Danny, do you have any thoughts if people want to try this? I'm curious how you usually introduce it. Do you take them through a technique like you kind of just showed us? Or like how much do you let them tinker and how much you know frustration versus, versus support do you give? Yeah. Um, well, you know, adults are more difficult than kids. Kids are easy. <laughs> You just tell them to have fun. They're like, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I mean, the hardest thing is getting them in the mindset of they're not being judged when they're doing this. Um, I have how-to books. You can get them through my website. Those are like have three really good projects, how to make creatures, flowers, and cities. When I'm teaching, the first thing that I address is the mental state of the student. And like, is this person in a good mood or not? Is this person open? Are they closed off? Are they shy? Are they scared? What's going on? So the tape is sort of like, like there for them to 
play with, and then I can see each student, like how well are they using their hands? Do they need help? Are they a listener? Are they someone who wants to learn on their own? And so my, my, you know, I'm like, you can't be bad at it because you've never done it before, but you can judge yourself and ruin your own day. And then like going through the process with them and, you know, when you stop and talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, you can find out if they just want to fail on their own for a little bit and then that'll make you for, so they can listen or if they're ready to learn. And so one of the lines I use is like, look, I just want to show you how I make things out of tape and then you're more than welcome to do it however you want, which is like, you know, let me show you how I do it. And then if you want to do it however you want, do it that way. And it's giving them the choice to do whatever they want. But also, you know, when I have them make their first shape and then stick it on the person to their left. And then after they make a few shapes, I have them try and roll the longest tube they can and then take that tube and reach across the table and grab someone else's shape and make it better. And so most of the time in the first class, no one takes home what they create. I take that and I put it in the sculpture that I tour around the world. And it's because we're all making something together, but it's to get them out of this process. Like, look, it's really just about focusing on the process. It's not the end result. It's not, and it's not my art, and it's not your art, but it's our art and the cost of learning is your shapes. So they're there, the class is free, and it's just like a way to get them disassociated from what they're making. And that's something that, I mean, some kids really want to take it home and they take it home, but for the most part, they're really proud that they made something that's going to go around the world and be shown in museums and fairs and in art galleries. A way to get them to participate with the process. Um, and then also, you know, you don't like your first drawing, you judge yourself so much more over your first drawing. And then when if you go back 10 years after that and look at it, you're like, oh, well, I'm so much better than I was. And you don't even think about it any longer. So sort of removing that from them too. So they don't, they can just, they have but not the end result really helps. And it really helps the people who aren't very um, good at it. But then it challenges the people who are very good at it. They like, they get determined and then they go home and they do it more because they're like, oh, I have to like do it. And it teaches them to start over, which is, you know, just repeat yourself through the process. And that's how you learn. People get stuck. They're like, get stuck on trying to start the tube just right. And I'm like, well, don't even worry about that until you make the sculpture and then just go through the process again and again. And that's the process of refinement that is very important. So you have just described like all the different dimensions of building the maker mindset, like with, with a roll of tape and a process. You've definitely motivated me to get back into my tape agami. Thanks. Very cool. Yeah, I, you'll never before. It's true. Do you have any questions um, with, with the group for Danny? OK, well, in the meantime, here's, here's your marshmallow. <gasps> oh, yes. Right here. Here's your graham crackers. And it's sticky and gooey, just like a real marshmallow. I love it. And gooey, and then squish it on there nice and good. Oh. And then you need your stick, right, to roast it. So. This is amazing. It's happening. It is happening. Thank yeah. you. In masking tape form. <laughs> very, very have cool. Questions, you can contact me through my email, and I'm happy to answer them. Or if you want to run it on your own and you want me to Skype into your camp or your classroom, just let me know. Awesome. Cool. And we did have one question or a couple questions. Is it similar to quilling? Uh, parts of it can be very similar to quilling. You can take the tape and you can roll a bunch of tubes together. And you can then slice those tubes into shapes so you get more cell-based material. And then you can take those shapes and you can make... Um, very complicated structures with it. And this is also a way you can draw with this or make flat two-dimensional um, panels. Wow. So, cool. All I can say is At wow. The same time, yeah, you can. So this is one of the lamps. Now, uh, where's the camera? So, so this is a big board. Nice. And I just noticed your so. giant wow in the background, which is awesome, too. Okay, I have yeah, a question for him. Yep. Yes. Can I go ahead? Okay. Um, do you ever come across bad masking tape? We've had a couple batches that just won't stick. Um, are there certain brands you always go to for your tape? And then what do you do when you come across bad masking tape that just won't stick? Uh, well, yeah, that's if you're buying the cheapest tape out there, you're, that's why it's the cheapest tape. It's the same way if you buy a cheap colored pencil, you can't make a really beautiful drawing with it. Um, just don't buy it again. Right? <laughs> we didn't. 
Yeah, I use um, Duck Brand, which is from SureTech, which is based out of North Carolina, um, as the tape I teach with, because it's the most structural. It's actually inexpensive as far as masking tape goes, and it's pretty poor quality for painting, but it's strong and it's rigid, and so it's great for making sculpture with. What but was that I brand again? To, uh, Duck Brand, it's SureTech. Sure. is the company name and it's duck brand masking tape cool thanks. and there were some there thanks for asking that because there were some questions from the audience about which is the best tape to use and if you can use colored tape and i i believe in the beginning you showed us an amazing sculpture that involved the colored tape yeah right? you can well just another word for ribbon that's not it's a ribbon that's not a cloth and this is adhesive tape because it's got glue on one side of it so, you know, you can use the technique of, and people do this with car, with um, newspaper a lot too. They'll roll the tape or they'll roll the paper into a tube and then they'll staple it, build structures that way. So, you know, really there's a separation between thinking about a material and its physical qualities and thinking about how you manipulate, reassemble it to create with that. Um, so it's like my manual dexterity is developed to roll a material into a tube and then fold it in different ways. So whatever that material is, like there's different material qualities and you can do different projects with duct tape than you can with masking tape because one's flimsy and one's rigid. And, yeah. Wonderful. Well, good. And somebody from the audience did want to know if that the lamp behind you is made of tape. And I that, believe you were just sharing that it is. So yes. you can light up the whole world with masking tape. I love it. Uh, well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for everything you've shared and for the digital some more. That makes me so happy. And, you know, some of your shapes that were highly um, mathematical in nature reminded me so much of some of the very cool stuff that Kathy is working on uh, with paper and such and uh, many different materials, sometimes materials in one dimension. So, Kathy, do you want to share a little bit more about all your cool 3D projects? Sure. I will see if I can pull my uh, slides up here. Let's see. Are you seeing that? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so these are some projects from my paper inventions book. And I also go around to libraries during the summer um, and do workshops. So I just did a workshop where we were actually rolling up um, newspaper to make geodesic domes. Um, and that is a project from the book. This took 90 minutes and I could relate Danny to you talking about having to teach kids how to roll and having to develop the manual dexterity. I think out of that group, we had um, two kids that were able to roll the newspapers up tightly enough that we could use them as struts to build that thing. So we divided, everybody had jobs and uh, a couple of the kids and I were rolling the struts and then another couple of kids were measuring and cutting and then lots of masking tape to hold the whole thing together. You can see there, they were constructing it in different levels, but um, I really like that project. That was for that Build a Better World uh, library program that libraries are doing this summer. So that worked out really well. And um, a lot of the projects for my book are related to math. Um, the one at the top is, of course, the uh, dome is geometry, and at the bottom there you've got a, a folded paper dragon uh, fractal, and, and this uh, pink one over on the right here is a hexaflexagon that is uh, I made from a strip of paper that's folded in a certain way, and then it becomes something that you can kind of flip around like a um, fortune teller, and you end up with a... Um, flat shape that you can flip around and end up with three different sides. Um, and I got this from a video by uh, mathematician Vi Hart, and she did a cute variation on it where she made a burrito out of strips she cut out of tortillas. And I showed this video to a class I did last year, and they um, <laughs> insisted that they wanted to do it, and they actually organized it themselves one girl stood up, started making a list. Okay, this is the ingredients we need. And she started handing out who's going to get the lettuce, who's going to get the cheese. And they, I just sat back and they organized it themselves. And the next day after, at the end of the class, they put together these hexaflexagon text burritos. 
and that's the guacamole stage. Each you would unfold it, put in some ingredients, and then refold it and get to another side and put more ingredients in, and there they are eating their handiwork. I just thought that was wonderful of them uh, taking control of the class. And that made me think about another project in uh, the Paper Inventions book, which is making your own edible paper out of rice flour and potato starch. And it's actually incredibly simple. Um, you take a piece of um, saran wrap and pull it really tight along the plate so that it's, um, you know, like a drum head. And then you spread the batter on it and put it in the microwave for a minute and you end up with a nice thin piece of uh, rice paper that you could cut that same way and make your own edible hexaflexagon. So the uh, directions for the edible paper were in Make Magazine issue 52 and there's also um, on, online and I think Bridget you said you could link to that so people could find that yes. project. And um, so the book that I'm working on right now is fabric and fiber inventions and that was the idea we were talking about going um, from one dimension to three dimensions. Uh, one of the projects is doing crochet and you're taking what is basically one dimensional yarn and just folding it, knotting it, looping it on itself to create 3D um, pieces. And one of the things I made is a hyperbolic um, design hyperbolic space is, is a special kind of space that just expands uh, very rapidly from one point. So this is a, um, it's based on a sea slug and this was inspired by a hyperbolic crochet coral reef that um, was designed by um, some mathematicians out in California. Bridget, you know their names? Yeah, so Margaret Wertheim and I believe her sister. There's a great TED talk um, of right. Margaret Wertheim, yes. Yeah, she and her sister um, do this wonderful crochet coral reef project and they have um, reefs all over the world that they have um, helped develop. So this is inspired by them, I really love that. And let's see what else I've got here. Oh, so then one other 2D to 3D uh, project from my book, Musical Inventions, which came out this past spring, uh, is making a paper popper. And I'm pretty sure that this has been done in classrooms around the world when kids get bored, but you basically take a piece of note paper and fold it up. And when you flick it forward, it makes a nice percussive sound. And I'm going to go back to my live. Am I live there? Okay. Yes. So yes. I've got my paper popper. It is, this is piece of note, notebook paper. I folded up the part with the holes, but you basically just fold it down. I don't know if you guys can see. And let's see if I can do this correctly. Okay, so you've got this folded part, folded again in half, and then you push down this corner to get this kind of triangular shape. And these two chambers here are what are going to make the pop sound. So I'm going to try this. Cover your ears if you don't like loud noises. Hopefully it'll be a loud noise. And let's see if I can get this to go. Did you guys hear that? Nice. So that's paper instruments. And um, I love it. I don't know if that's what I've been doing with my project. So I can show you this is the hyperbolic crochet. It's nice and soft. And what I like is that you are increasing it a little bit in the middle, but then when you get to that blue edge to make it nice and frilly like that, you like put three stitches for every one and it just makes that nice frilly edge there. Yeah, that uh, version that looks like brain coral. That's kind oh, of cool. There's, we have the 3D printed brain and now we have the coral yeah. crochet brain. And I'll, I'll just say one of the coolest things about the, the story um, that mathematicians for 
ever were trying to model this hyperbolic space and they didn't have a good way to model it. So Danny, it really connects for me back to what you were saying about the like being able to make things like physically with your hands kind of versus digital. Um, and finally, one, it was a female mathematician who happened to crochet, figured out you could you know, design these algorithms into the crochet, and that was the one way, after trying with computers and all these different places, they were able to succeed with the model. So I thought that was a really cool, cool story behind that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big believer that we can't um, really manipulate things until we understand their physical form. Like, until we understood the physical form of DNA, we weren't really able to manipulate it. So. I, the more physical, the more that we can have a model of the way that something is, the better our understanding of how to change and manipulate that it becomes. Cool. cool. Yeah, they actually didn't. There, there were mathematicians trying to prove that hyperbolic shapes did not exist <laughs> until somebody was able to make a model of it. And then once they had a model of it, they kind of realized they said you know i could buy a head of lettuce that looks like that too or you know sea slugs look like this they didn't recognize that this shape actually existed until it was something they could handle so that's very true cool well do people have questions for kathy these are amazing projects and i love the i love that you went for even from 1d straight to straight on up to 2d and 3d i i Wonder if you'll be making in 4D next. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> How do you take the yarn to 4D? That's that's one creative challenge for all of our camps out there. All right, any other questions from out there in the world or with our group? I want to know how those um, those tortilla hexaflexagons tasted. That looked like an amazing experience. Yeah, they tasted, they tasted pretty good. Um, I think we only made cheese because we didn't really have a kitchen there. Um, but it, the most fun part, like I said, was that the kids did this themselves. All I did was show them a video. I was, you know, just for laughs, and that they, you know, took ownership of it. I think was was the most fun part. That is cool and probably something that we're seeing happen at a lot of our camps, right? You kind of have an idea of how a project might go or what project you might do next and then the kids end up taking it in a whole new direction. Has anybody else seen that phenomenon happening? I've seen it quite a few times already. So, but you gotta do what they wanna do, right? Yeah. Gotta make them be makers and let them be creative. Definitely. Um, Angela, there was a question in the community for you before we wrap up on, um, it's back to your VR painting. What software or app did you use? Yes, so I actually jumped over to there and I wrote, it's a tilt brush. So I did respond to them already, but just awesome. in case they didn't see that in the chat, it was tilt brush on VR. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and then also for Kathy, we're wondering on uh, what types of, um, dyeing or screen printing projects you have planned potentially in your new book? Um, well, I've got just a regular screen printing in one chapter and I'm now working on a chapter where I'm going to try to do screen printing with conductive ink and see if I can make a circuit on a shirt. So, Ooh. and it's gotta be, you know, kid friendly too. It can't be toxic or need to be you know, heated it to 500 degrees or something. So I'm going to have to play around with that and see if that's possible. But that's one of my um, hopes that I'll have a project like that in the book. Wonderful. And then our camps are curious, will there be sewn circuits since that's one of the, the paths? Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for being part of this today. This is great. Um, I have a couple creative challenges to end on that I want to put out to the camps. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. Okay, so for our 3D creative challenge, me, many of you all saw along the project path, we have a couple 3D makeys that you can make. So we have the paper makey, 
um, that we saw, Angela, that was behind Angela. Um, we also saw a lot of um, 3D um, printed makeys. And of course, you can also, um, you know, turn yourself into makey using lots of cardboard boxes, right? Making a robot costume. So um, any, any 3D makey you want to make, we wanted to ask you to take it to a place um, somewhere near your camp that kind of represents where you are and um, take a makey selfie. So this is kind of like if any of you have seen the movie Amelie, where they have the garden gnome that goes traveling around the world and gets picture taken, you know, with the Eiffel Tower and things like that. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, we could we could put the makey next to the 3D doodled Eiffel Tower that we saw earlier today. So you can set up a scene or take it out into the world and take a shot and then post it on our community. And it'll be really fun to see makey going all over the world um, in many dimensions. So that is the, the latest creative challenge. And last week, uh, we weren't able to get our, our um, digital some more kind of challenge up here. This was the picture I was referring to. So um, Danny, thanks again for making us a digital some more today. I think that was a great, um, a great example. And we have, oops, we have um, you know, some of the other digital s'mores popping up in our community. So I uh, would love to keep seeing any of your um, ideas for what that looks like in digital and physical reality. Um, so keep sharing that as well. Um, so with that, I think that is everything. Thank you all for joining us today. And um, keep up your making in many, many dimensions, marshmallows, makeys, and more. We will see you next time, same place, same time. And next week, we're going to be focusing on our change the move path. So we will see you then to talk a lot more about cool moving machines and see what's happening um, all over the world in that respect. Thank you.